the oratory was uh, an Italian congregation in origin. It finds its foundation in the 16th century uh, in a man called Saint Philip Neri. He was a Florentine. He moved to Rome as a layman and he must have been a very attractive personality because he quickly gathered around him a lot of followers. He acted as a spiritual guide to them. He was ordained as a priest and really gave his life to prayer, preaching and the sacraments. Now, our particular oratory here was founded by the blessed John Henry Cardinal Newman. When he became a Catholic, he went to Rome. And while out there, he encountered the oratory. He decided to bring it back here to England. So this building where we're sitting now is his oratory. He built this house. He built this library, and these are his books. The library consists of the collection of books that the Cardinal uh, himself compiled over many years. It is based on uh, the collection that he knew at Oriel College, Oxford. He devised the um, cataloguing system, an indexing system for the books, and that system is still in place, and indeed the physical library still exists as he knew it. Many of the books here contain annotations by Newman himself and indeed in some instances annotations by him and other interesting figures such as Bishop Bossuet, part of whose library the Cardinal inherited. The Cardinal's room, which is inside the enclosure of the Oratory House, has been preserved exactly as he left it when he died in 1890. It is the room in which he wrote letters, prayed and upon becoming a Cardinal offered Mass. So many of the books in that room we can conjecture were of particular importance to him, that he wanted to have them close to hand. The room contains many religious items that were very dear to him, rosaries and prayer books, his breviaries. Also there are many mementos and uh, pictures, photographs of people that were very dear to him, uh, for whom he prayed every day. There is no electricity in the room and generations of fathers have kept it as untouched as possible. Unfortunately, this does mean, after 124 years, that the room is in a somewhat advanced state of decay, to the point now that, regrettably, uh, we've had to close it to visitors. The Newman Archive has been in the hands of various archivists over the years, mostly members of the community. But in a very real sense, its first archivist was the Cardinal himself, and his system of organisation is the one pretty much still in place today. Interest in Newman is alive and very healthy. I receive frequent and regular requests from all over the world, from scholars wanting either to come and access the archive in person, or to receive copies of items contained in it. I think digitising projects will have a great appeal to people from a variety of disciplines, historians primarily of course, but also political scientists, educational theorists, precisely because Newman was such a wide-ranging Victorian intellectual who wrote, corresponded with all sorts of different people, intellectuals, politicians, ecclesiastical figures, artists, musicians. So in, in that regard, I think it's not just the Newman community or the Newman scholarship community that will benefit from this digitization project, but the scholarly community at large, at least in humanities. It will greatly democratize Newman scholarship, people who don't have easy access to this facility, who don't have the means to come here, um, will now have an opportunity to use Newman's manuscripts, all that there is basically from behind their desktop computers or their laptops. A project such as this is going to absolutely revolutionise access and make things available in a way that we, you know, we couldn't have dreamt of before. And I think it's going to change scholarship, the way people research and work on Newman, not just purely in terms of access, but being able to find things they wouldn't find before, to ask questions based on those findings. So the actual way of accessing and the implications, I think, you know, can't be underestimated. I think they're going to be very, very profound. It's not that things weren't available, accessible at all in the past, but we had the difficulties, forms of medium like microfilm, microfiche, um, only in a very few places, very few institutions, mostly in the United States. 
and they would just stand alone. But what we can do now is interpret, we can interrogate with digitization to get to get behind the material, get the context. And it's also revealed sources, materials which we didn't know were there because they've, you know, they've come to light. So that's another add-on really. And I think uh, already I've talked to other scholars. I mean, they're very excited by this. And, and I think, you know, the coming years it's going to be reflected in the scholarship. The archive has been in various locations throughout the house, which has resulted in a certain disruption to and dispersal of its contents. It is the scale of the archive that makes it uh, a daunting prospect to try and organise and manage it. We realised that this was going to be quite a massive project. Most of our projects tend to be quite small. So in this instance we decided that we would bring in uh, a dedicated team to work on the project. So we now have a dedicated photographer and assistant specifically working on the Newman Institute project. We estimated that there were about 250 archival boxes. Each box contained about 500 documents, so it would be a thousand images per box. We're used to dealing with a range of documents, so when we open these boxes and we find all sorts of strange materials inside, things that are folded over, that are glued in. Um, we've always got people on hand who can help us with this, like the collection care department, they can come and offer advice on how we can digitise without damaging the objects. My name is James Robinson, I'm one of the heritage photographers here at the John Rylands Library for the Centre for Heritage Imaging and Collection Care. One of the ideas of the Centre for Heritage Imaging and Collection Care and the type of work that we do is we work very, very closely with the Collection Care Department. So the Conservation Department are there to maintain objects, to clean items, to rehouse them, uh, to have preventative measures so things are put in place so an item won't deteriorate any further. We don't do any restoration work or any interventative conservation work where things would be changed or altered. The collection care department are also responsible for the maintenance and monitoring of the areas where items are stored. Since the library's refurbishment in 2007, we now have three full uh, dedicated storage areas that are climate controlled and fire suppressant controlled. Uh, they're very, very secure. And down in the red basement is where we have our, we call it the chic cage, which is where we have all of our external clients, items and objects for digitization. Pretty much all of the objects that we work with are incredibly fragile, also incredibly important and incredibly rare. We don't want to be damaging these items for any further use. Obviously we will be getting the digital images, but the preservation of the item is of the utmost importance. Uh, we have a number of different uh, suites and ways to digitise items for anything from museum objects down to small books and manuscripts, photographs, glass plate negatives, any kind of heritage material. We use phase one uh, camera equipment, uh, primarily IQ 180s which are the 80 million pixel medium format backs. The camera is specifically made for copy work of this type. It has no internal mirrors so there's no movement and it can be fully controlled from the computer or your desktop. Items are digitised on the copy stand or alternatively on the book cradle which is specifically designed for photographing books. Items are stored on site. Um, I collect them at each, each day. I bring them upstairs to the studio. Uh, I unpack the items. Each item is then placed on the copy stand or the book cradle and photographed with the camera equipment that we have here. Directly after capturing the image, we crop, rotate, rename the image ready for archival purposes. We maintain accurate colour correction using the colour charts. Uh, this is so what you see on screen or in print is an exact colour copy of the object in front of you. Once everything has been digitised and archived, the items are rehoused in archival sleeves and purpose-made archival boxes and then returned to Birmingham Oratory. The room to which the archive boxes are returning has also been greatly improved and work has been undertaken to ensure proper archive conditions. So as well as conserving the archive in digital form, this project is also ensuring the longevity of the physical archive. Essentially the overall goal is to give worldwide access to the archive that only people who have visited the oratory in the past have been able to see. We're building a comprehensive database using 
um, open source software called Omega. In addition to using standard Dublin Core metadata fields, we, such as searching by author, title, or keyword, we've created a separate set of a controlled vocabulary that we'll be using to tag the images that are specific to the, the collection itself. So ultimately, we'll have close to 30 or 40 fields, um, each identifying the image in its own way. Anyone will be able to access the data. We are shooting for an audience of, of course, the scholars and academics who will use it at an advanced search level. And we also want to open it up to lay people who just have an interest in Cardinal Newman and would like to browse the images or do some simple searches themselves. This is a very large project. It's going to be a work in progress for quite a while. And by that, I mean years. Um, we calculated informally that if one person were to catalog the images of this database, it would take um, close to 20 years. So we're trying to get many people involved. We're implementing a crowdsourcing technique where we're going to be asking academics, scholars in the program to contribute metadata. I think most people would realize that in order to make a project of this size possible, help of the public is needed and especially help of other scholars and I think very many people would be willing to help, especially graduate students, um, so people who have relatively more time doing their PhDs, uh, I think would definitely be able to, uh, to help assigning metadata labels or even some transcriptions. It's hard to see an end date to this project as enough initiative is there is going into it. It's a massive project. Um, we're looking at close to 30 terabytes of data being entered into the entire database. So we want to make it a living project as much as we can. In other words, we'll be opening up to the public information and images as we, as we can.